Somebody writes in, and it's more writing than Stugatz will do on that book. The show promoting a book that might never see the light of day sounds like a lawsuit waiting to happen. LOL. This is the greatest comedy bit ever written that Stugatz will not write, and it is not a bit. He is running a scam this week on vacation, and he's got all of us on deadline. He's on vacation. I have to have something done by Friday. Mina had to have it done during Super Bowl week. Greg Cody has to have it done on Friday. Doesn't have a back in my day because he has to do it by Friday. Andre Dawson has to have his in by Friday. Stugatz is on vacation. Is there, wow, flaccid mic this morning. Is there any sort of uh, like punishment if you don't write it? Is he threatening you? Absolutely like, not. What if you just don't do it? I'm not like him, and none of the people who he's asked to do this are like him, where we say we're going to do something and then don't do it. He's chosen the people he could best take advantage of. He is a seasoned hunting grifter. A book that's still unwritten. That is pretty smart. He tried to sell one to Lucy at the Super Bowl. Yeah, he like came up to me after we were at like Dominique and Mina's podcast and was like, do you see the website? Are you going to pre-order? No. A book I'm that's your friend. Unwritten. Just give it to me for free. No. There's no such thing as gratis books. You got to pay for those. Or there's, free. There's if no he such, writes one, I'll buy it. There's if he no, actually writes it. There's no such thing as authors who don't write. Don't waste your money, Lucy. But he's got legitimate authors that he's not paying anything. And I have legitimate questions about whether he will write a single word himself. Because I've told you before, and I'm not making this up, when he told me to write the foreword, he spelled it F-O-R-W-A-R-D. And? <laughs> what an idiot. See, Dan, what you don't get is that he's talking about moving forward, and you're thinking about book terms forward, right? No, he's talking about moving forward. That's what you got to get on, his vision of forward for the book. Are you guys offended on my behalf? Yes. Comedically, that he would request that I ask Mike Wilbon, who will not speak to him, to write the forward, and when Mike Wilbon said no... He then asked me to write the forward. Are you not offended on my behalf? 
I don't know why he asked Wilbon to do it in the first place. That's always your forward. Fame. Because they had beef or something. It's fame. <laughs> it's fame. He's a bigger is name Will than you. Is Wilbon a bigger, is a bigger name is, than you? Is, is he? Yes. Yes. Is he? Uh, yes. Yeah. No, of course he is. Lucy concurs. Yeah, he's a bigger name than you. But I like you. I like you so much more, Dan. I don't know him though, so it's, maybe that's. Not I, even but I think it's. Un, I think it's unquestionable. He's had a daily television. How much sh- is his company valued at? Hmm. Good question. Okay, but that's not. How the much ma- is ours, by the way? That's not. Yeah, the that's ma- a good question. That's not question. the measure of fame. Uh, we weren't talking about a salaried worth. I don't think we were talking about fame. And he's on daily television with one of the most successful television programs of any kind for twenty straight years in the middle of the worldwide leader. He's one of the few people that they're paying substantively over there as one of their high pow- uh, high powered salaries. I don't think there's any question that Mike will and and he's on all the NBA covers. That's a side gig. Like the 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 the, the PTI gig is the thing that he's uh, less interested in. He's always taken more pride in being a part of the NBA coverage. Yeah, he's definitely more famous than yeah, you. Yeah, but net worth. That's all you, baby. Fist me. Mm-hmm. Wow. But why? I mean, if we're purely going off fame, like Stugatz could have started a little higher up even than Mike Wilbon, no? Well, but I think he was going for the joke of this person hates me and I want him to write oh, a fair. forward that rips me even more than Dan would rip me. And I don't think anybody's going to rip him more than I'm going to rip it. I mean, that's true. Is your first sentence going to be like, I hate this person? I mean, I don't hate Don't him. write no, it for him, just, Chris. Just, I'm just trying to think of a funny first sentence. Well, but I, I, well, I'm I mean, not very creative. I, I, don't, I don't hate him. None What's of your us- lead going to be? L-E-A-D. <laughs> <laughs> uh, put it on the poll at Lebitard Show, Juju. Uh, forward of a book, F O R E, or forward of a book. F-O-R-E. Are there more than one leads? Yeah. Yes, L E D E. is getting confusing. Oh, You're the boy. son of a journalist. I know he doesn't. He, he doesn't know letters, anything so. of, about journalism. But on this one, I'm guessing the audience uh, also put this on the poll, Juju at Lebitard Show. The lead of a story, spell it like lead, or the lead, L E D E. Uh, because I don't. There are two leads, by the way. Yes, there are two leads. Thank you, Roy. Look at Roy, joyous, and and Roy. I don't mean to temper your enthusiasm, but you are. Well, I'm I'm not. The listeners are writing in a lot. Uh, the Florida Panthers won last night against o- Ottawa in overtime. They're winning every which way. They now do. Are they the best team in the league by points now? Did they pass Boston last night? They're not the best team by points. That'll be Vancouver, but uh, they should. Yeah, they are number one in the Eastern Conference. Okay, so uh, somebody writes in. It's got to be so funny, or it's going to be so funny when the Panthers lose in the playoffs again. I cannot wait for the Panthers to flame out again. Are those Maple Leaf fans that are saying that or Bruins fans? Why would you root against this hockey team, which was the lovable underdog story that did what very few playoff teams have ever done? In fact, in the first round last year, did something that none of them have ever done. And this year looked to be completely overwhelming better. They are. I would prefer that they would be playing like this uh, at the end of the season. But the only reason they weren't playing like this at the beginning of the season is because they were still hurt from how long that playoff run was. Well, for the first time in my life, I can honestly say that this team is the villain this they people hate this team now which of course now i'm believing just like tom hanks in the league of their own when gina davis came back to catch at the final yeah. game we're gonna win <laughs> we're gonna win they're annoying what an old reference they're it's annoying old. it's 1992 <laughs> that's pretty old 34 hey, years ago wait a or second. no i get the reference older. i, I get older. the reference i'm just saying it felt Roy, a league of their own is older than jessica tony and lucy Yes, is a by a decade, generation. very young, by a We're generation. Gonna win. We're gonna win. <laughs> the Panthers are annoying. Yes, they are. They the, are absolutely annoying. The best part of last night was Brady Kachuk, Matthew Kachuk's brother, fighting Bobrovsky. Well, Bobrovsky, <laughs> no, 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 it was the other way around. Well, Bobrovsky, Bobrovsky going out of net, but like I just always wonder, hockey is such a weird sport. Like after the game, is there any tension between Matthew Kachuk and Bobrovsky after he almost decapitates his brother? No, absolutely not. No, like I love it's just a weird sport where like Kachuk's like, "Fuck yeah, dude, get my brother." Mark. No, that that is the sport. Like they're probably gonna go out and get drinks after the game. <laughs> like weird. Brady's gonna get drinks from his brother after the game. It's weird though. It it is weird. I really do think we should. All sports, that's how we should handle beefs in all sports. Fighting? Yeah. Just let them go. The refs stand. 
until they go to the ground, it doesn't stop. All right. Uh, that is where they changed all the rules in the NBA on fighting because it spilled into the stands. And then next thing you know, Steven Jackson was punching the customer. If it stays on the court, of course, Dan. I mean, let's not get ridiculous. Yeah, but you can't contain it to the court. Even in hockey, you see them go over the plexiglass every once in a while or go over Every the, once in a while. <laughs> over, over the bench area, you see every once in a while, you see, you know, f- f- wasn't there a. F- yeah, there's a famous fight where where a fan ended up in the in the in the bench or penalty box area. Yeah, it was uh, it was Maple Leafs Flyers. It was in Philadelphia. Ty Domi was in the penalty box. The fan fell in. You knew that exact thing off it's the top fa- of your no, head. It, Dan's yeah, like, it's wasn't there this famous. one time? And Roy's like, no, it was exactly this date, this year, and this. I didn't give a date though. <laughs> Ty Domi ended up getting a water bottle and squirting him with water, and wow. the guy went after him and fell right in. Amin El Hassan will be here momentarily when he's done with oddball. Uh, but hockey is unlike anything else anywhere in sports, as uh, where guys wouldn't speak for years in the other sports if they got into some of the fights they got into in hockey. We didn't talk the other day about what happened this weekend in the Incarnate Ward game, and I'm surprised I'm talking about it. It's only because the video is so flammable, because I remember this video started with, I believe, one of the announcers saying, an Incarnate Ward, uh, or... or it's just words. See, what's wrong with this? This is how beefs are handled. Like a Catholic school. A Catholic school. Um, that that I that I believe one of these teams. Correct me if I'm wrong. Texas A&M uh, Community College. No, I, no, Commerce. Thank Commerce. you. I don't yeah. know these teams. Uh, improved to three and eleven on the season. The thing that I know about these teams, and it, clearly their names are not among them. Uh, the things I know about these teams are now just that this video exists. I, I love these type of videos because I love to find where I would be in these videos. You'd be number five. There. Yeah, I'm the guy yes. that's like, guys, come on. Yeah. What are you doing here? Like, yes. He didn't mean it. <laughs> he didn't mean it. <laughs> there were bloody faces involved in this fight. Um, that's an interesting haircut by number nine. <laughs> Can we go back to your pronunciation real quick? Yeah, what of, happened there, Of Dan? the team names? Uh, well, I couldn't. I'll tell you what happened there. In that I saw that incarnate word where my friend Ricky Still Williams a little weird. worked at as a running backs coach. I saw that they had lost the game, and it began. The video began with the announcer saying someone had improved to 3-11, and 11, and I, I got confused. I was reading the wrong side of the scoreboard. And so, yes, uh, so I said Texas A&M Community College when it's Texas A&M Commerce. Yes, that's the name of the city. Yeah, Commerce. And uh, how do you say incarnate word? I I thought it was like incarnate. Incarnate word, yeah. Not you said Ward like Charlie Ward. Ward. Yeah. That's right. Yes, that it's is incarnate true. But Charlie did I get Ward. both parts of it wrong? Did both get... parts did sound incorrect to me, but I okay. may also be incorrect, Dan. Incarnate is not the way that that's said. I've never, incarnate. I've never like incarnate pronounced word. the second syllable that way. But I don't. I again, I don't. I don't know. I'm from the Midwest, that's so okay. I probably say that's it wrong. all right. All I know is that I've got great video of a fight that we're only talking about because there's great video of a fight, and uh, Chris Cody is advocating for more of that one on one. I think like they do it in hockey until you go to the ground. If more people get involved, they break it up. But if it's like I got beef with you. We just we drop the gloves, we go, and we can settle this. I do, I do think in some sports. I mean, we'd have to really think this out. I don't want to just make a blanket rule in every you, sport. You already, you already made it. Well, and I'm just, I'm, I'm going out there and then I'm walking it back. I'm really like, how can we actually do this here? I well, do think it would work in MMA. I'm a practical person. <laughs> yeah, actually, they love each other after the fights. You got hugging and kissing, and everybody's happy after the fight. Well, that's uh, that's a respect thing where fellow fighters look at others who fight for a living, fight for their money, and there's a, a respect that once you're done with that, both of the fighters know better than anybody how scary and vulnerable all of that is to be in there with just one other person and you're fighting over who wins gets the money. Like that, it's it's so primal that you can't help at the end of the adrenaline of that to be relieved and be like, I'm glad all of this is over. A little bear hug. Not, I'm glad yeah. we're not doing any of this let me, anymore. Let me paint a picture for you. Week 12, 4 p.m. games, Rams versus Niners, middle of the third quarter. Oh, bad blood. Trent Williams, Aaron Donald flip off their helmets. Like, all right, they're going, guys. Like, after a play, like, just something. Get out of the way. And it's just, like, I am paying for that fight. Where are they going to go afterwards? Is there a penalty box? 
Uh, no, they just get kicked off the field. Sit out, sit out of play. Sit are out you, of play. Are you too old to remember the hysteria in the media after the malice in the palace? Like I just remember, didn't. Dan. This is not going into the crowd. This is one on one. It this starts is... not going into the crowd. It begins not going into the crowd. Are you not familiar with how rage works? You can't, you can't turn that <laughs> off on the on the field. Like, All right, it would that's be it, funny. Guys, we're good. We're it good. would be funny to watch Ed Hockley's son try to break up that fight. I did this on South Beach Sessions with Steven Jackson, uh, and I urge you to check Sean it Hockley. out. It's got a lot of uh, good information in it. But one of the things we did is broke down the video of he's following a mentally ill teammate who's doing what his therapist has suggested he do by laying on a scorer's table and getting away from triggering situations. And then a fan throws a beer from a distance and lands squarely on his face. And Meta World Peace flips out, and Steven Jackson is so crazy loyal that he just follows him into the stands. And the media, that that story was fascinating for a number of different reasons. Chief among them to me is that immediately after the fight happened, all of the coverage I saw, mostly on ESPN, was pro-player. You cannot throw a beer at a player. And then the next day, someone had made a call overnight I'm assuming whoever was the president before John Skipper, Mark Shapiro, somebody else made a call overnight. And then the coverage all changed the next day. And then uh, Stephen Jackson incurred three million dollars worth of penalties that he wants a refund on because he's he's he is pleading his case on South Beach Sessions in a way that was pretty convincing to me. I urge you to check it out if you want to be convinced on what can happen when these fights spill into the stands. I know on the post game show after the game, John Saunders lost his mind. He was pissed at the fans, and then flipped the switch the next day. If we're honest, Dan, it was a laser by the fan, like. like it's don't throw stuff, but what a BB by that, that guy. That was a dart. Like right at it, like what was he, like 17 rows up, right in the face. If he had not been so accurate, right, we that don't have that. Fight never escalates. Ron Artest was trying to calm himself down with therapy aided devices, tools he'd been given. That's the South Beach session I want to see. Wow. Let's get that guy. I mean, I want to see yours too with Steven Jackson. I'm just saying, man. Mm, yeah. I, I think you can get that on It Is What It Is. I think he's on with Cameron and Mace uh, this the boys. week. Who are, yeah, they're climbing. Uh, Mace is now going back and forth with Shannon Sharp. Shannon Sharp is going back and forth with everybody. He is uh, escalating his profile in a pretty substantive way while uh, promising his sister he will not have any more public beef as uh, comedians uh, continue to make fun of him. Beefs pay well. Beefs do pay well. Um, one of the things that I wanted to ask you guys as it related uh, to beef and what's been happening here with J.J. Redick and uh, Austin Rivers and uh, J.J. Redick went after Doc Rivers. Now, Austin Rivers and Doc Rivers have a strained relationship. So I'm, I'm listening to J.J. Redick and I hope he can bring this. I don't know if he can. I don't know if there's the space for it. But he he is a transcendent basketball talker. J.J. Redick has a way of getting on first take, and his analysis and information are so thorough, researched, and prepared, and his knowledge of the game is so substantive that um, he can wipe the floor with your points if you are not solid and speaking beyond cliches about your basketball analysis. Now, he is joining Mike Breen and Doris Burke as part of their broadcast, and you don't hear this very often. This is J.J. Redick going after Doc Rivers because Doc Rivers was making a whole bunch of excuses at the All-Star game. I've seen the trend for years. What's the trend? The trend is always making excuses. Get Doc. We get it. Taking over a team in the middle of the season is hard. It's hard. We get it. Just like getting traded in the middle of the season is hard for a player. We get it. Mm -hmm. But it's always an excuse. It's always throwing your team under the bus. They lose to Memphis. Oh, it's his players. Memphis was playing G League guys and two-way guys. And then you look at his quotes over the weekend. Now he wants to take credit for the James Harden trade to the Clippers working out. He wants credit for that. There's just no <laughs> – there's never accountability with that guy. I mean, legitimately pissed, and you heard the pen thrown. That was a spike. End. He snapped it. Uh, he was a Clipper while Doc uh, was the coach there, right? So maybe he got thrown under the bus by Doc when, you know, when he was playing there, right? It does seem – that it does feel personal. Like, I think as we're about to hear from Austin Rivers – his best seasons were under Doc. Well, but hold on a second. So Patrick Beverly comes back at J.J. Redick 
uh, by saying this is wrong to retire and then do this on air when he saved your career. And J.J. Reddick's response to saved my career, first he says, Pat, my guy. Uh, my guy. You have to oh, throw no. that in there. You have to throw that in there. Pat, my guy, there's there's a – but that – so that's – there's not menace. That's, that's bringing no. him in close. Yeah, like, hey, that's I wanna, like, like – You're brotherhood. my guy here. I want to tell mm -hmm. you something here. I got news for you. Mm -hmm. No one's listening, just me and you here. Okay, you say Pat, my guy, as if it's not menacing. It couldn't be more condescending. I mean, because he says, save my career, FOH. So it can't be Pat, my guy, fuck out of here. Oh, you know what it meant. We were just back here. Does Dan know what that it, means? It, right? it can't be – it cannot be – FOH and and then JJ Reddick says as well I had a 4 year contract to be a starter with my option like he gave the contract details same amount of money 4 year starter 4 year contract I was going to be a starter and he's like Doc Rivers did not save my career but here again Austin Rivers who doesn't doesn't have a great relationship with his dad is now coming after JJ Reddick too First off I don't feel responsible to take up for my dad he's a grown man he could do his own thing uh, but in this regard I just simply don't agree with it. Um, for someone who's not accountable, he seems to always be held responsible, considering he's the guy that's always fired when things don't <laughs> go right. He got fired in the bubble uh, for a 3-1 lead versus the Denver Nuggets, which in half his team didn't want to be there. They had players saying that their mind wasn't there. They had guys leave. That happened. Then he gets fired for losing to a team that was favored over him, which was the Celtics last year. Um, it seems like he's always responsible. It's just a strange coming from J.J., and I have some love for J.J. You're my dookie. You know that. You're my bro. I love you. <laughs> um, it's just your best years were with the Clippers. I don't think he saved your career. I appreciate you, Pat. But I don't think it – I mean, I, this just seems a little bit weird. They're, they're three and seven. Dame has missed most of those games. Middleton's missed a lot of those games. They haven't even had their full team yet. We'll see what happens. The pressure is there. They do have to perform. But in terms of accountability, like, what, what are we doing here? Your best years in the NBA were when you played for him in the Clippers. Let's not – Forget that. I don't know if there's, like, frustration there or there's tension there between you. I know a lot of times we had to sit you towards the end of the game due to defensive reasons, but you had your best years as a starter there, especially our whole system was drafted around you because you're a shooter. You're not a guy who could put the ball on the floor. You were a strictly shoot guy. You're not like Clay Thompson or Steph who could put the ball on the floor. You were a guy who could catch and shoot, and you did it at a high level. Hell of a career, by the way. Big fan. But your best years were under him. It's just very ironic and kind of weird that you have this energy towards him in terms of him never, ever being accountable, considering he's always been responsible. I mean, just textbook right there. Yeah, I that's, mean, that's textbook good. in insulting him while complimenting him, insulting him while saying I'm not insulting you while insulting him. I feel like the fact that he didn't have to throw a pen also, like yeah. you have to give him. Now, I've seen the back and forth since this, and I, I truly don't know whose side to take. I'm waiting for Amin to tell me later on. <laughs> but um, I, I think the fact that he delivered it without throwing the pen really is a yeah. notch in his column. Yeah, I, you got Dan, you got to look at where he did it, right? J.J. Redick was on first take. You know you have to elevate for first take. You got Shannon on one side. You got Steven A. on the other side. You got to be that energy. I don't even know where Austin Rivers did this. Was it on like – the NBA, NBA show, today, NBA like their today, daily show. A, a bit of a more chill atmosphere that he can kind of have more room to roam. But Stephen A., Shannon, you got to bring the energy. But there was great shade in there. Didn't play at the end of games. We had to sit you. Couldn't handle the ball. That's right. We, me and my father, me and my father had to sit you during games when you couldn't be trusted to protect a 3-1 Love lead. you, though. You're a Duke guy. <laughs> yeah, love you, but it doesn't sound like it. You couldn't dribble. Um, it is uh, tremendous. I side with J.J. Reddick. And I do understand the point that Austin Rivers is making when he says, what do you mean accountable? He keeps getting fired. Like, it's the We maximum. do blame him for a but, lot. Yes, but he is so good at charming his way through the excuses on why it's not his fault. Especially this last week or so, he's been cranking out the excuse machine. Oh, but he goes to the All-Star game, and he's like, oh, I you know, I started three and six. And what does he immediately say? I told him to start me after the All-Star game. It's a tough road trip. It's like, what? <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing? Has he by chance ever uh, sold a book that he hasn't written yet? A book that's still unwritten. Seems like we're making some comparisons here that are bringing me back to that first conversation we had. Austin Rivers works hard. In no way was his career saved by Doc Rivers. Stugatz, I am told. Chris, where are we on this? Tyler, uh, Taylor. That was a crazy thing Taylor just Taylor said. just told me he wants to do weekend observations from Colorado. What? <laughs> and I haven't spoken to him all week. Like, I don't know, man. <laughs>
every day, very early in the morning, 8 a.m. Eastern, David Sampson, who has not slept, covers more terrain on nothing personal in 50 minutes than I believe any individual host doing sports radio or podcast at the moment by themselves. More ground is covered by one person than anywhere I have heard in sports and a lot of stuff off the beaten path. So I urge you to listen to Nothing Personal. It is award winning for a reason. Uh, David Sampson has been very public and loud about his hate for Scott Boris, the super agent, uh, because of how fraudulent he was after the death of Jose Fernandez, milking the pieces of it that he can use for his own gain to look good and then abandoning the family thereafter. Scott Boris has made himself very wealthy, changing the entire finances of baseball in a way that enrages David Sampson. Now, this year, I don't know what's happening with the free agents. There are four Boris free agents who are unsigned. Can you explain to me what's happening, David, and welcome with baseball's free agency? Well, I can explain what I hope is happening, which is finally, after all these years, Boris and his clients are about to get royally screwed. That is the hope. That is what we hope every year until one owner breaks rank. And I'm not talking collusion. I'm just saying one owner ends up being the one who bails out Boris. But now I think this could be the year that he's gone too far we're here on February 21st. He's got Blake Snell, Jordan Montgomery, Matt Chapman, and the fourth player, uh, whose name is escaping okay. me right now. It's all right. Now. That's allowed. Oh, my God. It's okay. That's all right. No uh, sleep. Snell, I was going to text you this morning at 1.30 when Snell I was watching had, the Snell was goals. great, but you'd be really offended if he got one of those 250. He was great last year. I can't believe that San Diego wasted that season from Snell. Well, he did win the Cy Young. That is true. But he's a five and dive guy. He's not someone you give 200 million to. Bellinger is the fourth. And the way Boris works is he promises his players an amount of money. And then if it doesn't come, he says, don't worry, it will. And it happened with Juan Soto. The Nationals offered him $440 million. He said, no, thanks. I'm going to wait and see. Now Juan Soto will not get $440 million from anybody. He's now on the Yankees after a failed time with the Padres. And so what we're watching for now as the regular season starts a month from yesterday, am I going to South Korea as part of Metal Arc in uh, March? First, I'm hearing of this. I, this is yeah. the first request. I don't think we're ta sending you to South Korea. No. So no, you are not. The Dodgers open the season against the Padres. It's Otani in theory ready to be the DH at for $700 million over 20 years. That's quite an expensive DH. And so the season starts in a month and these players don't have a place to play. What Boris is doing to try to keep this scheme going is he actually has a spring training facility where his players do spring training, those who are unsigned. So Jordan Montgomery and Blake Snell will throw bullpens and get their arms stretched out and Bellinger and Chapman will get at bats. And the hope is that some team will come forward and give the long-term deal. My hope is that all four of them get the Carlos Correa, Boris, pillow deal of a one plus one, where you get one guaranteed year and then an opt out and a an team option for a second year. Then Boris will take the podium and he will say, this is exactly what we wanted. We wanted Blake Snell to make 40 million a year for two years. And he's totally lying because of course that's not what Snell wants. He wanted the 200 million. So the question you're asking is great. Is this finally the year where no one bails out Boris? And that is certainly the hope in the industry. Explain what you're doing there when you say an owner breaks ranks, but it's not collusion. Because an owner breaking ranks would be only breaking ranks if there is collusion. So what, what you need for collusion is an actual act. You need there to be a meeting or some sort of communication. Do not sign Scott Boris clients. And if you do, you will get in trouble. That is not what actually happens. And we can go back to when collusion did happen in Major League Baseball where there were, there was a settlement, there wasn't necessarily an admission, and that was before my time. The way, the meaning of breaking rank is that 
all of the side sort of talks that happen from ownership down to presidents, down to GMs, down to people in scouting and player development, where you talk about the value of players and you say, hey, are you looking for a Bellinger type player? Because we've got someone, do you want to talk about a trade or are you going to look to sign other types of players? But there's nothing officially that comes down from the mountain. So there is no collusion. What breaking ranks means is that all the owners are very aware that Boris has four clients out there and they are individually deciding not to be the one to sign him. It happened with Barry Bonds. Everyone decided they were not going to have him inside an organization until Jeffrey Loria broke ranks and made him the hitting coach of the Marlins. And it wasn't that we were told by Bud Selig, you may not hire Barry Bonds. We don't want him in the sport. It was just one of those things that was understood. Dave, when you're talking about those caliber of players, and obviously we're getting close to the season starting, and they go unsigned, like what what happens? Do they just be like they're free agents and nobody signs them and they're they're excellent players just sitting on the bench? They're free agents. They can come on the show. They they're not busy at 705 every night. It's not going to happen. Those four players will find a home. The, the class of players that are really struggling right now are the middle class, which has been squozen in a way that reflects society, where they're not finding the deals. And so players like a Lucas Giolito found a middle class deal or a Lance Lynn, but many of the players you just stop talking about. They sort of disappear from the league. One of the things that we used to do with the Marlins is we'd keep a list of all of the players who disappeared and we would say, hey, do we want that guy? Because we could probably get him close to the minimum. And then you've got some of them who say they, they would do a spree well. I wish Amin were there because when I say that, uh, that, that, that totally falls flat, doesn't it? Amin, Dan, will, do you remember Amin, what... Amin will be here in 25 minutes. Okay. So there was a player in the NBA who said, I don't get off my couch for blank money. It was a player named Latrell Sprewell, and it was an absurd amount of money. And then he followed it up by saying, I've got to feed my family, you know. And it didn't land exactly well. And this was post PJ Carlissimo, another reference that probably is not landing he choked, right he now. He choked his coach. He actually choked his coach. Why that doesn't get more attention is got beyond pl- me. It got plenty of attention. David, it got but plenty. But it's forgotten about. D- David, Your whole room doesn't know Dave, about it. David. Uh, we, we all knew about David, it. We, we know about it. David. If I'm you. doing word association with the audience and I say Latrell Sprewell, multi-time all-star or choked his coach, everyone is saying choked his coach. Well, I think spinning wheels. <laughs> That's a great poll question, except it's leading. If you just did word association, Latrell Sprewell blank. What would win the poll for filling in the blanket? Choke his coach. No, I don't think that wins. David, are you crazy? David, are you for David? You can't be this forgetful. An NBA. I'm talking about younger people. I don't forget. An NBA player choked his coach, and I think that's what the name Latrell Sprewell is associated with, even though he was a very good basketball player. So I believe it would be not above 50% of respondents would come up with that on their own. If you presented it as an option, I think more than 50 would choose it. But if you left it, Blake, I'm not sure they right, actually Juju, would. Juju, put it on the poll, please. Latrell Sprewell, and just put uh, either all the multi-time all-star or choked his coach. You only no, get... no, you can't do it that way. <laughs> what rims in there too? How do you, and rims also put in rims <laughs> as well. What what do you want? How do you want to do it? It's just word association. When I say Latrell Sprewell, you say blank. All right. That's different. Comment below. All right. So fill in the blank. Okay. Good engagement. Yeah, yes. <laughs> it's fine. Lots of replies. He's changing the way that we do this. Um, can you – I've got a number of different questions, so we'll bring you back for another segment. But uh, I, tell me if I have the legacy of Rob Manfred correct because it's a, oh bit con- it's a bit convoluted for me. And this is how I would describe Rob Manfred's legacy. Was bad for baseball, but made baseball a lot of money and therefore is good for baseball and then fixed baseball. <laughs> well, you just dropped an and fixed baseball as though that's a small thing. The rule changes from last year are likely going to be his greatest legacy, though he has five years left. And I've got a little nugget for you all today. That announcement that he was retiring in 2029 
That's five years from now. There can be a lot that can happen in the next five years where he doesn't leave after five years. The owners may ask him to stay for longer. He may want to stay for shorter. That was just sort of a strange thing. Normally, you don't announce, hey, I'm gone in five years. So I would say that it's not time to write his legacy yet. But I know that you've got a thing with Rob because of Miami, and I get that. And from an ownership standpoint, that he's done a lot right for them, though the Orioles sale is not among them. But the most important thing that he has to deal with is the upcoming uniform issue. <laughs> no, it's not. The most important thing is collective bargaining. Owners don't care about the uniforms. They don't care about Boris. They just care about collective bargaining. I'm not going to be deposed. He was so pissed. Do was... people know about that interview in your room? Uh, I don't know how many of them know that me and Rob Manfred got into it. Tony, Lucy, Jessica. I love that Bimmel's calling me right now. I love it, Dan. Uh, yeah. What'd you say, Dave? <laughs> What'd you do? Did you do something wrong? Uh, COO's coming after you? I'm live on Dan's show, so I'm not going to take your call right now, Bimmel. Is that okay? Uh, that sounds he like He said it's... that's fine. Okay. He heard about South Korea is what happened, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Th that's actually not true. <laughs> Dan, that was the most hated. You became persona non grata in baseball after that interview. People colluded to make sure that you would not get guests. First the Hall of Fame stuff, and now man, man for doing that to him. I'm no. not going to be deposed. That's the way he says deposed. Like, how pissed? That's deposed. As, that's as pissed as you've ever heard a commissioner. Deposed. Silver wanted to do some of that Sunday and mu muzzled himself. Deposed. He approached me after that interview, Dan, because he knows that I had been appeared on your show so many times. That, that's actually and he had a not very true. simple. He had a very simple question, which is, why do you talk to that MFR? Wow. I'm not going to be deposed. What did you say? I said because it's great content and I love it and him. Deposed. Do you understand? how hard it is with a single word to show how condescending and arrogant you are about not, not wanting to be questioned deposed and i try a lot <laughs> it's so good i'm not gonna be deposed do you realize it's just greg cody in a lawyer saying i'm not gonna take a quiz i'm not gonna be deposed <laughs> <Not> so <true. laughs> i'm not gonna be deposed David, you mentioned the uniform thing, which we already talked about last week, but I keep hearing more and more about this. I've read long form articles about it. It does seem to still be an issue that fans aren't happy with the uniforms. Players aren't happy with the uniforms. And then yesterday I saw this video on the Mariners uh, Twitter account of one of their players. And I'm not sure if you've seen this, but if you look at this player's pants, we have to take the lower third down uh, <laughs> and we'll play it as B-roll. But you can see through his pants oh, and man. you can see his jersey tucked into his pants. So what's going on here? So oh, this is what they're trying to do. Tony Clark met the media yesterday and said, you know, we've got a uniform issue and it's a big miss and I'm hoping they're going to take care of it. But Rob Manford discussed it. The players are going to be fine. It is way too big a lift to switch out uniforms. You've got your licensees involved. You have to clear the shelves because if it's not authentic, you can't charge the prices for authentic. And so therefore it's sort of on field authentic. And so if they change it, they have to uh, reship everything and the union's not going to pay for it. The league's not going to pay for it. So I just expect some players to just have to wear an extra layer of underwear. But yes, it is not ideal, 
but it is certainly not a, a major bargaining issue at all. So the pants will be see-through this season. So you have to really look carefully, and of course, cameras are going to be doing it. That'll drive ratings. You do ratings. not have to look carfully in this video, David. To see not in this, in this. I'm thankful for the jersey, honestly. <laughs> the the video the video made it look yes. The jersey looks ridiculous. You can see how long it is. Almost, you know, it th- looks untucked because you can see right. the ends of it through and, the and, pants. And and it really is telling you, would you like to just whether you want to or not gaze at the package because so it, there are no players who play without underwear. Some players just wear a jock strap over nothing, but the majority of players wear standard issue. We give them sort of tight boxer briefs that they wear under their their jerseys under their pants so i don't think we're in any danger of any sort of penis capture of any of the players now could there be somehow some way the next fernando Seganal that comes out maybe but i just don't think that's going to happen what is the cup percentage in baseball way smaller than i thought when i started in the game i am blown away by the number of players who both don't wear mouth guards or cups I didn't they wear a feel cup. like it hurts. They, they don't like it on the swing. They don't like it when they run. They feel they've got sort of rubbish. And uh, a lot of rubbish. I, I, I have really tried to get players to do it, trying to explain to them that a ball on the ball is a real problem. Is that like a spring training like meeting? Doing. Like, what's that meeting look like? The meeting where you're telling players to wear a cup. Is there like, is it just that? Is it a cup meeting or you, you tackle a lot of things in this meeting? It's a, it's a lot of things. I go from cups to DUIs to let's play like champions to let's ignore the projections and let's try to, to, to win when no one thinks we can. So it's all mixed in one. And we give every player a cup. And what they do is they take it out of the jock strap and they just don't wear it. Now, catchers, there was once a catcher. Uh, do you remember uh, Miguel Olivo? Of course I do. That he always swung at first pitch fastballs. So not many people remember him. He was not a cup guy. And what's funny to me is when you're catching. That's got to be mandatory. That seems like you have to be. But, Uh, and there was a pitcher who did wear a cup, and he was a guy named, we had him, that crazy guy, um, Jose Manzanillo was a player who played for the Marlins. I can't remember what year. And he had a tick where he would hit his cup before he was able to pitch the ball. And he realized that he had to wear it because otherwise he'd be hitting directly the jewels. So he would wear a cup while pitching. Maybe that's why he was so ineffective. All right. I've got a number of different questions right now. That crazy Uh, guy. Please put it on the poll at Lebitard Show. Does a single player in professional sports play without their underwear on? Because David has said that none of them do. Also, I will tell you that many catchers have had fractured testicles, which sounds like the worst thing possible because of what David— Isn't it ruptured? Uh, I No. You can get that, too? I think it's different. I think it's— Fracture? I think it's a fractured What's testicle. What's worse? Put it on the poll. Right. Ruptures. Put it, <laughs> Much put, worse. Put, 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 it's a tie. I put it on the poll at Levitard. I went to school with a runner. kid who ruptured his ball, and he had to walk around like with a cane for like for oh. months because he couldn't walk. It was terrible. Oh, no. It's... Put it on the poll at Levitard Show. What's worse, fractured testicle or ruptured testicle and i don't think you got the player right when you mentioned fernando senegal Uh, you were mentioning a player who accidentally took his pants off while on the field no no seganal was a player who was famous for having the largest penis in all of baseball history i think that was julio franco no that that's great great point second place Okay, uh, but uh, the the thing that I don't think penis size matters if the pants are see through. I think if the we're gonna see ass crack a lot. I think we're gonna see shirts tucked in, David. I, I don't think anyone was like, oh, we might see a, a penis. I don't think that was. I'll the take the under on one sloppy. ass crack. You're not uh, gonna see it. No the way. under no on way. one. Yeah, that's no yep. I'm taking the over on white pants. You are seeing everything. <laughs> You're just gonna see undies. That's it. Standard issue. Crack. Okay. Uh, nope. Half. We, you, it's going to be crackless. We're going to see at least one crack before spring training's even over. Uh, guys, please put in the lower third. Just put in Steve Lyons uh, getting to first base and forgetting when he slid into first base that he was in a stadium full of people and therefore his he just pulled his pants down to uh, fix them. And I I don't. Oh, Tony Clark is there. That's such an old man move. <laughs> old men love to open their belt, pull the pants down, tuck the shirt in. 
don't doesn't care who's around. Pull the pants back up, redo the belt, look around. Oh, you guys, you guys see that? Whoops. Poppy does that a lot. Uh, my father one time got so nervous during a heat game that in the living room, out of nowhere, in front of a girlfriend, he just pulled his pants down and then pulled them back up. We've was, all been there. Big three era. Your girlfriend. Big three era. We've all been there. Yes, I don't. I mean, nobody's the been there. No, I've been there. Nope. I don't think anybody's been there. I you just I, by I, accident pull your pants yeah, down. He Chris? was just nervous and crazed. He was nervous and crazed. Sometimes you got to change it up, David. Uh, I understand the no. I don't understand that at all. Eh? What, ner what nervous tick is pulling your pants down? I want to point out to the audience that the video in the lower uh, corner that is Cecil Fielder. I said that that was Tony Clark, and that could it's not. It could not possibly. No, it's not. I don't, is it Jack Clark? It couldn't possibly look any You're less like Tony. It, it sure is not. It couldn't look any less like Tony Clark. But uh, Tony Clark, you mentioned, has spoken to the media, and you think labor unrest is coming to uh, to Manfred's tenureship, correct? I do. I I'm going to take the over right now. And I, and I haven't really talked about this on Nothing Personal yet, but if you're asking me to take an over or under on 99 days, which I believe was the amount of days of the lockout this past time, I think, I think I'm going to take the over. There's a lot of bad stuff going on already between labor and management, and uh, we're still years away. And all this uniform talk, it's just sort of a bait and switch to be distracted from some of the real issues. Tony Clark spoke about deferral. You've got a block of owners who are furious with what the Dodgers did. You've got a block of owners who are furious that their local TV revenue has gone away while teams like the Dodgers and the Yankees are, are really becoming more, more secluded from a payroll standpoint. So the biggest concern you have back in 94 with the baseball strike that canceled the World Series is you had owners fighting with owners. And Bud Selig was really good about eliminating that by having favors with every owners to stop blocks. Rob Manford's been really good about that too, but there's a lot more new owners now. The prices of entry are a lot higher to buy teams, whether it's Bruce Sherman or whether it's David Rubenstein buying the Orioles. The numbers are bigger, so you're seeing blocks of owners, and that's always a problem for negotiation. Give me the greatest secret you can on favors for an owner that Bud Selig would hold on to. Give me the best one that you know of where a commissioner is using as leverage uh, power in another place. The, the number one is when an owner gets approved. The number one way that leverage was used in my time was when the, Jim Crane had to agree to move the Astros to the American League in order to get approved as a buyer of the Astros. That is when, that the ultimate leverage is when it comes to your approval to become an owner. Now there's situations where an ownership group is chosen. So for example, when Jeffrey became the owner of the Expos, he was basically told by Bud, all right, you can take over the Expos. However, don't do anything to screw up baseball economics. And the first thing we did was give Graham Lloyd $3 million a year for three years and give a guy named Grady Sizemore, who's a name that some of you may know, we overpaid his slot when we drafted him with Montreal, and Bud called me and said, get Jeffrey on the phone because that's not how you behave. You're in this game because of me and like a parent. I brought you into this world and I'll damn well take you out. And of course, we were scared enough that we fell into line. That's why the payrolls were always so low, because we fell into line. Guys, I have a shameful admission. Is this a safe space? Is this a safe space? Sure. We, play, we showed the video before of like that old time, and Dan mentioned a player from the 90s. I have a shameful admission. I went most of my childhood being a, lar a very big baseball fan, thinking that Cecil Fielder was a position. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> when I was like eight, I thought it was like right behind the, the second base, like like a floating outfielder. I swear to God, this is not a lie. This is not for not comedy. A, not, se not center fielder, but right I in front of like, him was the Cecil, Cecil fielder. fielder. Go out and play Cecil. Like, I was like, Where was I'm, the prince? <laughs> we got 90 seconds left, David. What do you have for us in the way of a movie review? 
I had 30 seconds last week. Now it's 90 seconds this week. I want to get back to society of the yes. snow. I wanted to engage with you about this plane crash and what these people did when they started eating each other. Now they waited for people to die before they ate them, but they had nothing to eat. They were in the Andes Mountains. And it's become this major center of discussion. What would you do before starving to death? And the answer is, of course you eat people and you choose the largest people first and you start with their ass. All of that's clear. What I never I mean, understood is, why don't you cook the food? They all had lighters to smoke cigarettes, light up some clothes, put the meat on part of the tail and have a barbecue. But it looked as though from the movie that they ate it raw. Now, of course you do what you gotta do, but I worry about salmonella and all sorts of things. But I was thinking about it and, uh, I would absolutely eat someone before dying. Th that's actually not true. <laughs> it is true. Put it on the poll, please. Dan, I'd start with you. Wait, put it on the poll, please, at Levitard Show. Which cheek you going for? When eating... Left cheek, because he's a righty. When eating humans... What's your wallet side, Dan? <laughs> when eating humans, do you start with the large ones... And the ass. <laughs> yes. I'm not going to be deposed 